Lance. All right, I'd like to call the September meeting of Hudson River Blackbird Regulating District to order. <coughs> Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. A reminder about phones and pagers. Uh, roll call. David Bergstrasser. Present. Michael Asker. Here. Albert Hayes. Here. Philip Klein. Here. Thomas Stover. Here. Mark Finkel. Here. Michael Clark. Here. Robert Leslie. Here. Robert Coltan. Here. John Hodgson. Here. Carol Wright. Here. Richard Ferrari. Here. Thank you. All right. Uh, need a motion to adopt or revise any revisions to the meeting agenda. So moved. All right. I have a motion. Second. Motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Thank you. Uh, no guests that I know of. Uh, does anybody have a need for an executive <coughs> session? Hearing none. We'll move on. There was no sign up for public comment. So we're speeding through the agenda. All right, I need a, a motion for approval of the August 9th special meeting minutes. Any, no. any questions or comments before we do that? All right, I have a motion. Second. And then a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. Report of the Executive Director. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, you will find my uh, report beginning on page 10 of your package, I believe. Um, following the uh, special meeting from last month uh, held in Watertown, I need to report that, uh, um, as discussed and uh, approved during that meeting, uh, Black River area funds uh, were liquidated and transferred to Hudson River accounts uh, with the comptroller's uh, facilitation and approval. Um, following that, Fulton County Treasurer was paid for the $3.045 million, uh, dollars, uh, which represents the that's the, not the exact amount. There's more. Uh, there's another. Exactly. It's 3.045. Thank you. Uh, they were paid. That represents the previous two years worth of school and property taxes within Fulton County. Um, I have heard indirectly that the following that uh, several weeks following the payment of Fulton County, uh, the school districts were paid. Uh, for the previous two years' taxes. Um, and that is enough said about that at this point. Um, I do want to also point out that uh, obviously during the last 30 days, we've had uh, more than significant weather in, in parts or uh, of both watersheds. And the regulating district uh, and, and staff has handled it very well. And uh, I, our chief engineer, Mr. Fultan, uh, certainly deserves uh, uh, recognition for um, having, uh, in particular, Great Sack and Dogga in, in position. And uh, prior to I, uh, Irene and uh, for taking action uh, when it became obvious that uh, that tropical storm was headed right at us uh, to release additional water on top of what our normal release would be. Uh, we were fortunate uh, that he did that and also I will say fortunate that we did not get some of the uh, one foot plus uh, rainfall accumulations that further south did. Um, nevertheless, uh, uh, Great Sagandaga Lake nor any of the other reservoirs I I know Stillwater, uh, jump in and tell me if I'm off the mark here, Sacandaga and Stillwater did not go over the spillway. And uh, 
even with the follow-on events from, and I forget the fellow's name that they named the storm after. Lee. 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 Um, Robert e. That pushed us up even further, and uh, we are now recovering space from that uh, in the second dog and the, uh, everywhere else it was felt. Um, and that it would include Indian Lake and Fulton Chain and, and uh, Stillwater Reservoir. Uh, so our, our engineer and uh, the rest of our uh, staff uh, did an excellent job during, uh, prior, during, and after these events. Uh, at this point, I would like to, if you recall, um, during the July meeting, uh, the board uh, appointed uh, Mr. Hodgson, um, the Hudson River Area Administrator in an uh, acting capacity, uh, along with a commensurate uh, salary increase. Uh, I would ask now, ha having been two months since Mr. Hodgson's been in that position formally. Uh, he's done an uh, exemplary job. I would ask for a motion uh, from the board to remove the acting title from his, uh, from the Hudson River Area Administrator. And so we... If the, if the board chooses, I would... Yeah, I, I, I think we can do that by motion if, if the board chair wants to sure. solicit a motion. No, so All right. All right, so I have a motion to remove the acting and make him permanent, make permanent the title for uh, Mr. Hodgson. Yes. Second have, that motion. I have a second. I need more discussion. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? So moved. Congratulations. Congratulations, Mr. Hodgson. Uh, anything else? Yeah, I, you know, yes, and uh, I believe Mr. Ferrara, our CFO, may have more to say about this during his report, but. Uh, uh, related to uh, some of the additional cost cutting. Uh, at this point, we're our, uh, uh, inside of a year, theoretically, that uh, the uh, Hudson River uh, area's uh, accounts uh, prior to uh, them dipping negative, we would like to make sure that it doesn't happen in advance of that time, at the very least. Um, preferably not at all, I should add. Consequently, we're looking at every possible large ticket item or expense that can either be deferred or reduced. Um, and, and a couple of those being uh, <coughs> one of the discussions that we've had with related to the T1 line at uh, Conclaville, which serves the Canaris and the Internet. Um, and also uh, some of the, uh, at least a portion of the USGS contracts, which serve the gauges. There are certain gauges we cannot do without. However, uh, in a pinch, there are some gauges that are uh, nice to have, but uh, maybe have uh, outlived their usefulness in this day and age. Uh, so we are considering those also. That the, I believe the chief engineer is looking at uh, reaching out to USGS as far as um, dealing with those gauges and actually re eliminating uh, eliminating is the wrong word, uh, not paying for some of the gauges, letting them know, and if if uh, no other entity picks up payment for them, those particular gauges, uh, we've also got to determine what the actual cost savings is, but the total contract to the entire regulating district, it's both areas. It's a 300,000 three year, so it's 100K a year with the split being 50, 5248 black Hudson. So the Hudson in any annual period is around 48,000, 47,000 in that neighborhood. Okay. So I mean, we're looking at that a minimum deferring for those payments. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, exploring you know, uh, other reductions of the gauges, and because we are, this is the last, it's the last year too, correct? I believe oh, yeah. it is. Oh, this, it's of this three-year cycle, we have to be renewed next year, right? Coinciding with our next three-year budget. Gotcha. Right. So, so the timing's right to. I know I talked to Mike a little bit about. It. Yeah. You're talking about some of the gauges that just aren't. 
Uh, yeah, you know, we would require at, at a minimum we might only need the Sakandaga River gauge, the Hadley gauge. Uh, you know, I mean, technically, we really don't need the hope gauge, although it's nice to watch what's coming in, the, the, the method of calculating the inflow based on, and, and even forecasting it uh, based on change in stage in the reservoirs easily enough done. Um, and these gauges so, are all attached to a phone line? or uh, either they're, they're either phone line or, or um, satellite telemetry. Okay. Mm -hmm. But, and, um, but they're facilities that, you know, we could... I think there are at least some in the Hudson River area that we could uh, eliminate from the inventory, still meet our statutory obligation of measuring uh, stream flow to satisfy the operation and, and then also reduce costs overall. Mm -hmm. so if, if not just temporarily, maybe even permanently, but sure. uh, and it doesn't mean too that they wouldn't continue operation and someone else as a, a cooperative entity uh, would pay for it mm -hmm. if they felt that it was appropriate to keep okay. them operating right which could happen um, Brookfield or you know other businesses so. that rely upon gauging also okay so you want to you want to bring it back next month or we could do that that'd be good I did have one other thing uh, to add to that list, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, when we're discussing large ticket items. That I, I think it goes without saying, but it needs to be said anyway. Because we all understand the um, financial situation. Um, I mentioned in the beginning of this report that uh, the previous two years' worth of taxes within Fulton County um, have been uh, paid for school and property. Um, we have there's another year uh, upon us now for school taxes, and the first of the year will bring about another uh, another property tax or series of property tax bills. Uh, at this point, uh, given the action taken last month, uh, we have no appreciable reserve to do that again. And when I say we, I mean the entire regulating district, uh, the Black River area also having. Um, been drained uh, at this point uh, of reserves. Uh, consequently, um, until such time that we do receive uh, payment of the assessments um, in the Hudson River area, uh, uh, until that time we will be unable uh, to pay those uh, the current uh, school and property taxes uh, associated with Great Second Dog. I'll ask the question later on in the Mr. Lesser's report as to how the litigation is going. <laughs> and I, the, 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 in closing, I want to uh, mention that uh, back in June we received a letter from the Authority Budget Office uh, commenting on the mission statement that the regulating district submitted uh, to them actually following the March meeting of this year. And uh, it was a very brief letter. They had noted that the mission statement was inadequate for what they didn't specify why. Um, frankly, staff is unclear why it's inadequate. So we have reached out to the Authority Budget Office and have not yet had a response back. We, um, we actually did hear back yesterday after Okay. Late. Okay. Um, hmm. Well, I you might as well expand on it. Okay. Right. We reached out to the budget office yesterday afternoon, and Andrew Heck, who handles probably public authorities, and my guess is the person who responded back. Um, I asked him for clarification as to exactly what did they mean by that the mission statement did not adequately meet the criteria as set forth. It was kind of vague. Uh, and to my surprise and um, it, their issue is only with the uh, general nature of the one sentence mission statement that we have, uh, which basically says that the district augments flows and prevents flooding. So they wanted more specificity as to the how 
the district gets that done and for whom. And so we have put together a, uh, a revised mission statement which incorporates the how and who, which we think would satisfy the budget office. They have no other issues with the measurements or the mecha mechanisms by which we do measure our uh, mission. So I was pleasantly surprised by the fact that it was really that straightforward. So I, we'll have a, I don't know at what point we'll be. Because that, that within is, a week, it, right? It is due. A response to the budget office is due by October first. Right. So I think there's probably a board action needed to uh, at least give us authority to provide this revised mission statement to the authority budget right. office for their review. So we'll have to wait until the right. October meeting then. I I suspect so. I think yeah. I think their expectation is that the board is going to delve into this and, mm -hmm. and get their arms around it, really mm -hmm. have a weighty, meaty discussion on what it is we do, who we do it for, how we articulate it. And while staff have put together a draft that we think incorporates all of the things that they are looking for, are looking for um, while we will miss the deadline, it may be, be might be more appropriate to miss the deadline and take the hard look than try and slap something together just to make the deadline. Uh, we'll certainly, at the board chair's insistence, write a letter to them explaining. I was say, yeah. Why we're gonna miss we the acknowledge deadline. that we're we have the, the, that duty and we're working on it and we'll deal with it at the October meeting. Right. Yeah, Mr. Chair. Sure. Uh, maybe just consider this that we send them a draft and then that would give us the opportunity to meet the deadline and then then we could work on something that's a little has a little bit more meat on the bone if necessary and then we could adopt the, the final mission statement at the October board is that something that we might it want is. to consider if you'd like I I could read you the draft that we have yep. at this point okay the mission of the Hudson River Black River Regulating District is to regulate river flow through the operation of impoundments on the Hudson River at Conklinville and the Black River at Stillwater, Old Forge, and Sixth Lake for the purposes of flood protection to the public corporations, paren, counties, paren, closed, and parcels of real estate, paren, open uh, power plants, paren, closed, downstream of said impoundments, and by releasing water from such impoundments during periods of low flow, to provide sufficient water flow enabling downstream wastewater treatment plants to avoid increased treatment costs associated with waste discharge to lower volume rivers and enabling downstream hydroelectric plants to generate low cost hydroelectric power in the hot summer months when the rates are generally highest. It's a mouthful. Sounds yeah. like a good draft. That sounds like a good draft, yeah. yeah. Okay. Then we'll Send that off to them. How many sentences? It's not going to fit on a decal on a car. No, no, no. no. no it's not. <laughs> We'd have to buy bigger cars. Yes. Um, <laughs> yeah. Do you need just? Yeah. We don't need a motion to send that off to draft, or do we? we? Probably should. Okay. I, I present a motion then that we send the draft that was just re uh, read by our council to the. Is it? What off office, 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 office of budget? Office of budget. Okay. To um, to meet the deadline and then consider possibility of uh, further uh, clarifying the mission statement at uh, between now and the October meeting. Okay. Second. All right. I have motion and second. Any more discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? So moved. Second motion, Mr. Mr. Aston. All right. Anything else? Uh, anything else, Mr. No. Thank you. Park? Okay, thank you. Next, we'll get into committee sessions. We seem to have something under the permit, permit system. Permit system. Mr. Hayes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Under old business, we had none.
to discuss this time, but under new business, we have a, a discussion of uh, moving up permit renewal mailing, and I'm going to turn that over to Mr. Clark. I think the, uh, the concept uh, that we're looking at is uh, moving the actual dissemination, the mailing of the access permit renewals for Grid Sock and Dogger Lake uh, to, if I remember correctly, the beginning of December? Right, we did it around second week of December last year, and we'd like to do it a couple weeks earlier this year, just to facilitate payment yeah. coming in for no other reason. To facilitate, I'm sorry? Payment of payment. the renewals coming right. in. Correct. I would think because you want to get away from the holiday season as much as possible, too. It, it appeared to actually be well received last year. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the, the permit holders didn't, I mean, they, it seemed to come in at the same rate that they would other years. It just was ahead, you know, three or four weeks or more uh, from when they would have gone out in previous years. Right. So they did not really see, there was certainly no objection that I heard. No. Uh, and last year you kept the same due date as Correct. That's correct. Yes. correct. Yes. Right. Yes. Yeah. A lot of them came in early. A lot of them came in early, and, yeah. and many waited to the end, as they mm -hmm. typically do. There was. You're right. There's still that percentage that did. But again, it did improve cash flow slightly. So anywhere where we can, because mm -hmm. December is one of those months. By by moving the date forward, closer to us. Is there any impact on staff uh, or the amount of staff that we currently have will be able to get the mailing out in time? No, not that I'm I, We had moved it up last year, reflected uh, probably a three weeks earlier than, than previous years, and it, it went smoothly. Um, it's just getting the letters ready earlier. Yeah. I mean, it's just basically anything that we need that has to do with the mailing has to be. Okay. Just ready before. So they went out traditionally in June, January? And Correct. And we've moved it back there. Yeah. So we're back probably what, a month? I don't think no, we're well, now, more, it, more. this would reflect probably 30 yes. days earlier than, uh -huh. okay. than yeah. we historically have done mm -hmm. if you discount last year. Are you looking for a motion to that effect? Is that yeah, I don't, just a general information so that okay. the members understand what we're looking at doing? Yeah, that's, that's a good fun. idea. I mean, I'll, I'll ask you. You guys are the ones that live down here. No, I think that'd be fine. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thanks. Oop. And under uh, another discussion of permit revocation, I'll turn that over to Mr. Clark again. I will introduce this to the board. However, the uh, our Hudson River Area Administrator and uh, other senior staff have had multiple discussions about this topic um, we would like to present to the, the permit system committee uh, uh, situate two situations uh, very close to each other North Shore Road and Great Sacandaga Lake town of uh, town of, is one Tadley in one day they're very close they're, they're almost next door very uh, in the vicinity of Conklinville Dam they're that close um, to encroachments that involve significant amounts of fill on uh, uh, on the state land uh, where we have where staff discovered the encroachment early on uh, made efforts to stop the work that was still in progress uh, in the case of one permit holder uh, they were given a stop work order it was disregarded uh, and following that there have been numerous uh, attempts at uh, communication, written communication, uh, all of which, to my knowledge, have been ignored. Um, and DEC uh, law enforcement has also been involved. We do not know the status of that. However, they are also, uh, in their capacity, uh, particularly, I believe it would be protection of waters, in, in, uh, below, any work below mean high water, number one. Um, they're also involved in this and uh, so I, I think what uh, we're looking to do is we wanted to at least inform the board now that there is a situation that it has been uncorrected and and the permit holders appear to be unresponsive um, 
lay out the just briefly, uh, Mr. Hodgson. I'd like to lay out the just the, the chronology of this, uh, and uh, once he's done that, I would ask that in at the next board meeting, or if the board wishes uh, uh, the meeting after that, that if no further action has occurred, uh, no effort by the permit holders to actually remediate uh, the issues that they created to consider um, revoking uh, their access permit uh, for a period of time. How long has this been going on? Uh, well, well, actually, that's a, that's a good question, Mr. Estefan. Uh, John, could you uh, yeah. describe the two and start, you know, with the timeline? We've got a timeline of activity here. Uh, the one permit encroachment uh, well, February 25th, we sent out their access permit renewal to the address of record that we have and got their renewal fee back by sending that renewal to them. Then on May 31st, uh, a work permit uh, request was received. We gave uh, permission for placement of uh, materials, 15 yards. Uh, then on June 30th, the placement uh, 10 yards. Well, they, they submitted for 10, 15 yards. We gave approval for 10. Um, the placement of, they wanted sod brought in. We denied that. And we denied any heavy equipment operation on that permit area. July 11th, we received a phone call. Uh, an anonymous caller stating that he witnessed a great deal of fill material, earth equipment, earth moving equipment on New York State property on this permit area. So that same day we sent uh, some guys up there for a field inspection and there was a bulldozer on state property. There's a local contractor around the lake was doing the work. The an excess of the approved 10 cubic yards of topsoil placed and graded uh, on the New York State property line. Fill material was dumped and graded below the mean high water mark of 771. A stop work order was issued. July 11th, the same day again, uh, in the afternoon they went back up there and they staked out the state property line so everybody knew exactly where it was. And the work continued even though a verbal stop work order was issued. They issued another stop work order. And then on July 13th, we got a phone call from Mr. Bell. Uh, no, a phone call. We left a phone call to uh, the permittee, left a message on the answer machine with the number that they provided us on their access permit application. July 14th, a field inspection with a New York State Forest Ranger was done. And we discussed that, the encroachment, showed him everything, and he took photos. July 18th, the first encroachment letter was sent via regular mail uh, to their home address of their act, on their access permit application, detailing requirements and remediation. Uh, by August 30th, July 18th, a phone call from this from the uh, permittee was returned at his, uh, our office at 420 and our surveyor Dan Holchi explained the details in the encroachment and the issues and that a stop order, work order was issued and they continued the work. Uh, the permittee stated he was willing to comply and remediate uh, and work out a deal with the contract. August 4th, we sent a reminder letter to the permittee, certified mail, delivered to the home address of, again, the said applicant. Uh, sign, they signed for that and it was accepted by the permittee. So we did get a proof of delivery on that. August 11th, we received an email from one of our workers on the way to Conklinville he drove by that same access permit and all our stakes that we put in were removed. Jeez. 
So let's see, on August 15th, we did, uh, went up with another inspection. Work continued to be performed on this New York State property line. Raking, grading, seeding, watering of the access permit. They put all new seed down. Uh, they removed the survey stakes, like I said. A stop work order was issued on July 12th and 13th were ignored. A restake out of the New York State property line was done again. No remediation as of August 15th was done. And let's see, going to August 17th, uh, I called the Bells, left a voicemail with them, never got anything back. Uh, let's see. August 18th, we did a follow-up inspection. Again, work continues to be performed on the state property. No remediation. They had, at this time, they had a 40 by 100 foot party tent set up on us. And the stakes were removed again. August 24th, phone call to Mr. Bell. Left, uh, I'm sorry, in the permit, he left a message on the answering machine. No response. We sent copies of the two previous letters sent via regular mail, delivered to their home address. And September 7th, we did another follow-up field inspection of the encroach encroachment, and nothing has been done to correct the encroachment as of yet. So last time we heard from the permittee was July 18th, with numerous phone calls and letters with no reply. No remediation. Well, that was uh, well documented. That, that, that's great. You know, I would think that after all the time we spent or our employees have spent trying to work with these folks, any more time would be a waste of everybody's time and energy. And personally, I think that appropriate action should be taken and taken immediately. We can wait another week, another month, another season. You know? What? What kind of teeth does a stop work order have? Uh, well, it's a directive by a government okay. entity, but the government entity in and of itself doesn't have any authority to enforce it, enforce it beyond the, the scope of its authority generally, which is essentially our authority to issue a permit. We Mark. can revoke okay. or not That's issue uh, that permit. The permit is a temporary revocable permit, so we either revoke it or simply not issue it next spring. We're, uh, we're, excuse me. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, I just wonder if any of the stop work orders were in writing. Uh, not at that time. Since we given a verbal stop work order, uh, I thought it was best to come up with a new form, which we, the staff, has worked on. We've come up with a written stop work order form now. So that will be, that we'll start using I think that. that's a good idea, and then document that it was given to them in person or whatever. Right, whether they accepted it or denied it or yeah. tore it up in front of us. Or if I could add to that, I think that, uh, number one, that the stop work order was given in the, in the field. Um, and also, there did not exist any uh, any work permit for those uh, two sites uh, to begin with, if I remember uh, correctly. Bell did put in a work permit. Right. Okay. Not for the work that he did, though. No. It, it was not, not for the well, The work that he had done was totally outside the scope of any uh, permit that had been issued to him. Right. We have that all documented. Now you're, you're talking two permits areas, but was the work all done on? No. That's that. I have the same thing for another permittee for the same time frames and same type of uh, uh, proceedings that we did with notifying them with emails and, or uh, messages on the phone to letters. This second permit permittee hasn't responded us, to us at all with anything. This one here did accept one letter that we sent them. This one here. We have no idea if a letter has actually reached them or not. We have no proof. This weekend, uh, excuse me, we, I attempted to hand deliver the copies of the three letters that we issued them. Saturday and Sunday, I tried to bring it to their, their camp, and nobody was there this weekend. So 
I, I agree with Mr. Astapan. We've spent too much time and effort and money on them already. But what happens if we don't give them, renew their permit if they ignore that? What do we do then? Well, the one permittee has a dock down there with a couple boats and a mooring, and all that will have to be taken away or removed because they don't have an access permit. Anymore. Well, do we have the authority to do that? We've done it before. I so. yeah. yeah. I mean, that's all the purpose between having a permit and not having one. Yeah. Let me ask you this, though. <clears throat> Let's go back to the NCON officer. If the NCON officer was there and saw and was informed by us that there was a, uh, a, a uh, violation. Un unlawful violation occurring, could not he then have written a ticket or done something they have the they have police powers they, they oh, yeah. do have police power their their power is uh, derived from the environment and conservation law but different sections of the environment and conservation law than our authority to operate the permit system derived from so if we saw a violation of say their failure to have a work permit or their uh, depositing fill in excess of that which we permitted, that would only be a violation of our regulation and our work permit. That same action, the <coughs> depositing of soils near waters, might be a violation of DEC rules and regulations regarding uh, fill in, in uh, bodies of water, and he could write a ticket, the ECO could write a ticket for the violation of the NCON law based on the same facts, but it's not he's writing a ticket on our violation. Um, and that, uh, you know, basically there's a whole volume of the, of McKinney's uh, New York State law, the Environment and Conservation Law, Article 71, that deals with penalties which the legislature has provided as tools to that agency to pursue those violations. Would they the have not provided similar authority to the district. Would the local contractor, seeing how he was informed verbally also, be subject to some type of action? Probably action by DEC. Yeah. I'm not sure that we have Again, I'm talking DEC, right, because the officer was there. What, what right. DEC stated to us was that they would issue the ticket to the operator of the machinery, but not so much the contractor himself. So if we gave a verbal stop work order to the guy operating that bulldozer and he <coughs> continued, they would issue a ticket to him. And, but the remediation, is it, with the amount of work that was done, it, what would entail, uh, what would be entailed in, in the remediation? Would you have to take all that out? Have to go and remove all that fill. Mm -hmm. yep. Now you're, they brought it in. It's been done. And I have photos I can show you later, but where the state property line is, was filled and then took the private property then to the state property line. We took that out, now we'd have a, We'd have a bank there. He probably brought. If I, probably we had to dig down to our monument that they filled in was over, over two foot deep, and uh, from here to the road maybe, <laughs> Just to give you an idea. So I'll um, tell you, I, I I would mess around with, uh, with kit gloves on this. I'd come down hard on them because this thing's just going to keep rolling and rolling. If they get away with it, then. Well, that's it. We're in trouble. Mm -hmm. They what? No, and it, they it, get away with it, though. And we were talking about this morning, You know, everybody who lives on like knows that there's rules and respects the fact that there's rules. I uh, think <laughs> we get in trouble when we don't enforce enforce rules or, you know, people will say, well, how can we let this guy get away yeah. with it? I mean, if we don't do something, I think it's it, it, it's a problem. But well, we can't set that precedent. Right. The, the process from this point forward would essentially be a ruling by the Hudson River administrator, which then could be appealed by the permit holder, and that appeal would come to you, the board. We have to give the 
permit holder certain uh, notice. I think it's probably 10 days. Uh, so as long as we do that in the next week or so, we'll have plenty of time to notice uh, each of those permit holders and bring this before you at the next board meeting. Uh, next board meeting is in Utica, Utica so works. it's not terribly far. Is that something if we revoke a permit that goes to the press or becomes public in some fashion so well, that if it's done the other meeting. permit holders are right. aware that we've taken the action? Any any action that the that the district takes, whether it's a board action or whether it's an action by staff, is a public matter. Uh, it's subject to FOIL, so we can't hide the fact. Uh, on the other hand, if we're going to revoke permits, uh, this is something that we have not done in recent memory, perhaps ever, and if the board sees fit, <coughs> the staff will put together a press release and we'll make a big splash about it. I think we should. <coughs> One more question. John, uh, the, I don't need the whole address, but where, where is the permit holder? Where do they live the other 11 months? Or? Massapequa, uh, New York is their permanent home address. And then the other one I think is, somebody told me they lived there year round, but uh, I thought, and I'm not positive on this, on the one that I think is Glens Falls. Okay. But speaking of the other, one of the other uh, permittees here in violation of the encroachment, uh, this is, I've got encroachments to go back to 2006 from a previous owner, but then we have approached the new owner also with the, the violations that weren't corrected. Where one is a power pole with a meter on us and a rock wall, so I'm sure they, they're aware of the rules. This ain't the first time they went, we've right. dealt with them. Are they corrected? No, no. They, they, to this day, it goes back, well, this power pole was here when we bought the property. So there's no enforcement. Why, why would they correct it? Right. That's, that's my question. How do we enforce that? <coughs> I, I think we, we have the ability to uh, take action ourselves mm -hmm. and bill them for our costs All right. and condition issuance of a permit on payment of our costs. Um, the, the permittee who has a, a mooring out front is going to be, you know, a little bit more attentive when his boat is gone and we don't give it back than the guy who, you know, basically has a, a, a differing path to get down to a beach that he doesn't use anyway. Do we, do we have any idea why they put a 40 by 100 tent up? Well, they have a party up there. They have an annual, come to find out, they have an annual party up there. And That's all it was for? Pardon? That's all it was for? Well, <laughs> yeah, as far as we know. <laughs> well, apparently they have plenty of money, and I wouldn't worry about that. <laughs> they may roll our costs just into there. I'd like to, <laughs> I'd like to suggest that uh, Mike be able to consider, instead of our staff wasting their time at times trying to get a hold of these people, I mean, you, can, you send regular mail and certified mail. Just hire some process servers so that we know they got served, so they can't challenge it in court and be done with that part of it. You know, I wouldn't mess around with this. I'd go full bore, process server, whatever you got to do. You can always negotiate. You know, people are willing to listen after the fact, but you know, it's hard to make up the tracks once things are done. So. Right. Uh, can I make a public comment? No, I don't, I don't want to start a precedent there either. <coughs> Thanks, though. After, how about afterwards? <laughs> but you make thanks. It anyway? Well, you're, sir, we're, we're, uh, we're being webcast, so when you say hardly anybody will know, no. everybody, everybody is. Knows. Okay. Thanks, but thanks. <coughs> um, yeah, that's all I'm, I'm concerned about is, is, is enforcement. I mean, we can spin our wheels and 
send anything we want and tell them anything we want, but if we can't enforce it. But that's a team. difficult thing. Yep. Uh, we have had more success in, in the last couple of years uh, in dealing with some encroachment issues that we've encountered, uh, primarily by involving uh, DEC uh, environmental conservation officers early on. I won't say that it's been a, it's a panacea. However, it has helped with some of the common encroachments that we've seen. Uh, tree cutting is a prime, uh, unauthorized tree cutting is a prime example. It has been helpful, and I think we have had uh, considerable success at, while it still goes on. Uh, we've had success in dealing with uh, enforcing <coughs> the ECL and, our, and also our regulations that against that. Um, okay. We're talking revocation, not suspension, right? Permit. Well. Which means I, they'd have to go through an I mean, every, the, the permit expires every year anyway. Right. So they okay. constantly, so, you know, is it is it revocation or is it uh, non-renewal for the next year? Right. Mm -hmm. Semantics in part. Okay. I, I agree with Mr. Amstefan that we should. I think ultimately they would have to reapply. But if, if we revoke it or fail to issue it and they still use the property, what do we do then? Are they trespassing? The it's a problem we face all along. Is that for us? It depends how they use it. I don't want to interrupt. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's state land. Mm -hmm. uh, it is not their land. And uh, the permit does not provide them with access to that land. Uh, what the permit provides them with is the opportunity to place things on the land. So if they use it by putting something on the land that they could have if they had a permit, uh, we will remove that. And, you know, is there any way the state police could get involved? <coughs> well, I don't know. It depends what they leave on the land. I mean, if they leave a dock and a and a boat and a fireplace and a flagpole, and we take down the flagpole, the dock, and the fireplace, you know, somebody else may be taking away the boat. Aren't they trespassing? Though? State police? No. no. By, yeah. by placement of those things on the land, the state police aren't <coughs> going to. Uh, pursue a trespass case against anyone, whether a former permit holder or or others on state land. Mr. Chair. Robert. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't want to interrupt. Um, well, it, actually, two comments. First, we, did, we have had a permit where we removed um, Doc. Plus and yeah, they, that's right. They had a structure. Um, so we, we have moved it up above the taking line in the past. Uh, after having revoked a permit. That was within the last six or eight years. The board did take action to revoke a permit. Okay. Um, well, I appreciate that, Dr. So there is more, some more re recent history okay. of doing just this. Um, but the other question I had was, um, without a lot of effort, given that we're, our origin, the district's origin is environmental conservation law, is it possible without having to go through changes to our law or the DECs, uh, form some type of a, agreement or memorandum of understanding by which the NCON officers could be authorized to enforce our rules and regulations? Theoretically, I suspect that's possible. It might be something yeah, that we can I mean, if, if they could act on our behalf as a result right. of us well, that's my big concern. I mean, we're, it's complaint. not like, yeah, I mean, we're, 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 our origin is the same law. So. I want to protect staff against retaliation, too. I don't want John going in there. I mean, somebody chasing him out with a bulldozer. We are keeping DEC posted on everything that happens with these two, and they want us to proceed with our uh, course of action, and they are still looking at it and reviewing I think they're kind of waiting to see what we're going to do, and then they're going to probably impose something themselves. 
at a later date. The other thing we've done is I looked at it as what can we do to prevent this in the future? So if somebody submits a work permit to do work down below there and we give them approval, now one of our requirements in that work permit is to meet with the contractor and the permit E, show them exactly where the line is, stake it out if we have to, to make sure that everybody understands exactly how much bill they can bring in that they can or can't bring equipment in there. And this is for the big projects where they're looking to bring in riprap or, or fill or of some type. And we don't get that many a year, so it's really not gonna take up. I think the time to prevent this from happening again is well worth the effort than having to deal with all this after the fact. Mm -hmm. That's when we know about it. A lot of times this one happened, we didn't know about it. So we are taking preventive measures. So, yeah. Oh, I, I'd still like to look into some sort of agreement with DEC. Just, just so, so we have something in writing. And we don't have to rely on, well, you guys see what you can do first, and then maybe we'll come in and deal with it afterwards. Gives us an option. But yeah, I, I, there's no point in messing around with this right now. Could set off a domino effect. Okay, oh, I'm sorry. Just sense. Anything else? Uh, no, that's all I have. I got all everything documented here. I have photos. Anybody wants to look at the photos after? So, to kind of wrap this up then, if you, at this point, we're left with uh, the next step uh, a letter from the administrator, uh, Hudson River mm -hmm. administrator, uh, to these uh, two specific uh, access permit holders that uh, their permits will be revoked uh, unless... Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I would revoke them. Yeah, I'd revoke right, them. and that's what I'm no, saying, a letter actually... They, they are revoked. Right. Well, I mean, essentially, I think you're, whenever the time, whenever, whether that happens immediately uh, or mm -hmm. whether it's January 1st or what have you... Um, well, I would suggest well, that we send a letter, they are revoked, have a process server serve them, and you can put in there until this matter is resolved to uh, you, our expectations. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know, yeah. it's going to be stay revoked. Well, first. I, I, you know, don't play around with this. Don't. They'll have an opportunity to appeal, appeal their case yeah. to the board. I'm not sure whether it is a letter saying that staff recommend. Rec revocation and the matter will be heard at the October meeting or whether it is staff have revoked your permit and your right to appeal will be heard at the October meeting. In effect, it's mm -hmm. the same thing. Well, I'll make sure I work with John so that we okay. craft the letter in accordance with our regulations to okay. make it you clear. Because your time's too vital for to spend on this. You know, let's, week. let's try to get it done in October because they'll be leaving, you know, right. pretty soon. And keep track of any time where you're spending on this too. It's not gone already. Yeah, yeah, yeah. probably gone already. Close mess of people are probably back on Long Island. Mm -hmm. yeah. I bet we can get their attention real quick though. Hey, if they have to come back, that's, that's fine. <laughs> right. Yeah. Kiss is a lawyer. Kiss there's no more on the permit system. Okay. Thank you. Uh, under Mr. Astafan. Yes, sir. Under old business, we have none. And before I uh, comment on the new business, I just want to remind any of the board members who have not handed me their, um, Oh, what am I thinking of? Board evaluations, if you could do so either today or get them to me as soon as possible. Um, letter A, <coughs> resolution revising the management exempt guidelines. Uh, I'll turn this over to our attorney. Okay. Uh, just parroting what uh, Mr. Astafan said about the uh, board evaluations, I have extra copies if anybody needs one. Um, I'll uh, get them to you. 
the resolution revising the employee rules and benefit guidelines for managing exempt employees uh, should be in your board packet. Basically, uh, Chairman Burke Stresser's action plan delivered in response to the July 20th, 2011 <coughs> Inspector General's report uh, committed the regulating district to eliminate the flex time provision from the management exempt employee rules and benefit guidelines. Uh, the language to be removed includes an entire paragraph in Article 1 of that agreement dealing with attendance. Uh, the board's policy on policies uh, would indicate that the board, if it determines that this change in the management guidelines is not a merely technical correction, uh, it would require that the board consider this resolution at three successive meetings before uh, working on it, uh, finally approving it. And that would be my recommendation, that uh, you, you take a look at this, make sure that the elimination of this language is, uh, as we believe it to be, um, the elimination of superfluous language, uh, and Basically, you have a chance to, to think about it, deliberate on it, and uh, offer any suggestions at the successive meetings before taking action. Uh, and therefore, although introduced today, I guess I'd recommend that it be tabled for action at a later meeting. Okay. 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 That's fine with me. Um, anyway, want to discuss this? Well, let me just turn it back over to you, sir, for okay. your, your report. Uh, my board report is not terribly different than last uh, last month. Uh, I'll try to highlight a couple of things. In the five county suit, uh, the Appellate Division Third Department on August 25th issued a decision requiring the five counties to file their record on appeal and brief by October 24th of 2011. So essentially what happened is Judge Ferradino issued a ruling in our favor. The counties appealed. They didn't do it fast enough. We moved to dismiss the appeal. The Appellate Division Third Department, instead of dismissing the appeal, required the counties to file their brief by October 24th. So we were able to, with the Attorney General's help, speed up the appeal. So we ought to get a decision, uh, hopefully the end of this year or the early in the beginning of next year. So that saved us a number of months. Uh, as you'll hear from Rick's uh, presentation, that's uh, months that are valuable to us. Um, the, with regard to the same matter, on, our, on August 18th, uh, the Department of Law sent demand letters to each of the five counties requiring their payment of the assessments uh, within 30 days. <coughs> now, uh, barring compliance with that, it's the expectation is that the Attorney General is going to file suit. I characterize it as reducing Judge Ferradino's off uh, order of judgment to a money judgment. There is a sum certain due, and we want to make sure that when the county's appeal is exhausted, that there is an immediate order for them to pay, and that their non-payment of that order subjects them to contempt similar to the way Fulton County subjected you to contempt for non-payment of the judgment. Uh, and it should be noted that the Attorney General's Civil Recoveries Unit uh, intends to impose its 22% collection charge on any amount collected through their efforts. Oh. Yeah, I'm sorry, say that over again. Bob, um, yeah. you heard it right. The Attorney General's Civil Recoveries Unit That's so, over and above. Well, it's well, off the top. It's, it's off, off the top. top of yes. our assessment. It's so not over and above. That's roughly, we're owed, <laughs> we're owed ten million, 
at this point for amounts that are due and payable. Correct. And if the AG's office if the AG collects the ten first, million, we'll we get two point two out of the ten million. Yes. Correct. See, no, now well, that expense, <laughs> that expense will be an expense of the district, and if necessary, we'll reassess that, we reassess it right that, that against those same counties. In the in the uh, items that we can use in our formula for assessment. That qualifies yes. as, as an expense. As an expense, yeah. Okay. Yes. It's not it's not, not an assessment under the Federal Power Act. This would still be an assessment under the March 30th, 2010 apportionment. Okay. Nothing was ever said that they would assess us 22% if we win. Um, not if we nothing win. Nothing was brought to It's not if we win. It's if the well, counties don't pay. I mean, if, if we collect, right? If their, no, if their if actions don't collect, result no, in the collection. No, if we collect, they get We collect. Um, if we collect without their help. Yeah. I mean, nothing. We, we uh, mentioned that there would be costs associated with the collection. Nothing came to this board. I don't board. think anybody knew it was going to be 22 percent. Nothing came to this board about the AG's office collecting anything. So, uh, but well, we what if the AG's office doesn't collect it? Well, then they're not they're not eligible for that twenty two percent. Yes, can I interject something? Right. This pursuant to the budget policy, once the debt became over one hundred twenty one days past due, we were automatically required to send it to civil recovery. We didn't have a choice. So I'm not that, blaming staff. Don't take me well, wrong. No, I'm, I'm just, just saying that. I mean, we—that's not my I, point. We, we looked right into this because I was equally flabbergasted. shocked, flabbergasted, flabbergasted at the percentage, and uh, you know the civil recovery attorney, who's the Cremo. John yes, Cremo. John Cremo. Correct. Uh, he had walked me through the particular budget uh, bulletin that. You know, that apply to this. I've read them all, and it seems pretty, because there's two that are pertinent to it, and it seems clear to me that, in fact, that there's a requirement to submit any debt of any state entity to civil recoveries once it gets that old, and they can charge up to 22%. Huh. Okay, so we really... So we could ask the governor's office to... Sounds like there's wiggle room, I think. It yeah. should be. But at the end of, of the day, I, I wouldn't hold my breath on it either. Right. No. <laughs> but I, but we are I read up to, to as being but we are maybe able less to than. Collect that possibly in future yeah. Yeah. Right. That, so that would be my. Yeah. So what fine. we would do is it would become a budget <clears throat> item in the next cycle. Well, what I, if. I'm sorry, go ahead. Let me ask this question. What if we were to enter into a negotiation of the amount of monies that are owed? Okay, and arriving at a different figure, we're able to collect that figure in less than 120 days. Would that 22% of the old figure still hold? The Attorney General is in the case at this <laughs> point, and they're not going to let go. No, not. On, the, on the other hand, think of the 22% as a bargain compared to the 40% if we had gone to an outside collection agency. Well, I, that's true, but I look at it this way. You've got a state agency that, that's trying to help the public that's just about bankrupt. you got another state agency, which is, well, we're, they're the big umbrella, who should be there for us, and they're going to help take money from us when we need it to function. That doesn't make sense to me. Right, but it, the, the equities of the matter from the Attorney General's office <coughs> actually favor not so much us as the payee as they will favor the counties as the payor. The counties will ultimately suck up this 22% if we need it, which means that if the Attorney General is going to give any special treatment, that special treatment really derives to the benefit of those counties. So if they say, you know what, if you guys pay in the next 90 days, we're not going to take our 22% from the district. Instead, 
we'll take 5% and you, the counties, will then not probably be hit with an additional assessment from the regulating right. district. So the counties will save 17%. Right. It's a bargaining chip. It's, right. it's a bargaining chip for the attorney general to but use. But one way or the other, we collect our money. If Whether we, we collect it, it now. Well, it's, it's a bit of a bargaining chip for us because it may speed up the yeah. 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 process. If, if we need the money, we, we just keep it. adding it to the apportionment. Yes, sir. I could assume we get that 17% right away. Rather yeah, than they defer it there and then have to get <laughs> well, yeah. Unless there's many of them. I know. Yeah. Because of the way we budget, two years. because of the way we budget and the way we assess, if we need another $100,000 and the counties are paying their bills, then we assess another $100,000. Yeah. We don't have to wait for our annual assessment to do that. Okay. Another question. <clears throat> There's five counties. What happens if two of them pay their share right away? Is that subject then to the... Well, they're all over the 120 well, all days already. Right. Yeah. Yeah, they're, all they're all over. over. Well, so do they, do they understand this too? I mean, they have attorneys and people that figure uh, these things out, right? I would imagine. I, they don't really care. care. I, I figure know. we're going to eat it. I think they don't. Question. Uh, Usually, it's been my understanding, usually when a Supreme Court case, or su not Supreme Court, um, yeah, a local Supreme Court case. Supreme Court. Yeah. Um, when you win your case, the other side typically has to pay all your attorney fees and all that stuff. So why wouldn't this apply? Is there something different with this? Because well, we have state agency? Or? We, as you'll remember in the Fulton County <coughs> Case, we're not subject to interest and penalties. Mm -hmm. We didn't have to pay court costs. We didn't have to pay attorney's fees. <coughs> and that was because we're a public entity. Any, any such charge that we impose would go directly to those who pay our public dollars to fund us. The counties are in the same position. Any penalty we may impose for non-payment, or the court might impose for non-payment, uh, or interest accruing on those dollars go to the taxpayers of the county. And that's not fair to the taxpayer of the county to elect somebody who violates court order, who then subjects that taxpayer to pay not only the you know, $3 charge, but also a dollar fifty penalty in taxes mm -hmm. or penalty and in interest on top of that. Okay. So thanks. I don't think they're gonna be subject to penalties. All right. Okay. Uh, moving on with the uh, we briefly alluded to the Fulton County case. Mike indicated before that check has been delivered. That case is resolved. Uh, we continue to await the uh, U.S. Court of Appeals decision on NIMO's appeal. That has not come back yet. The Chera case, uh, on August 19th, Acting Supreme Court uh, Justice uh, Thomas J. McNamara, actually Acting U.S. District Court uh, Justice Thomas J. McNamara granted the District's motion for summary judgment dismissing Chair's claim as against the district. Uh, our attorney in that matter, Clem Parente, uh, is going to handle entry and filing under the CPLR. Um, the Niagara Mohawk cases continue forward. The SPC uh, filed its motion to intervene in the NIMO assessment challenges. Um, NIMO opposed it, we didn't, and uh, we await the court's decision in that matter. Um, so that is, a, in a brief nutshell, our update on litigation. Uh, if there's any questions, I'll try and answer any more. Yeah. On, a, on the chair case, just a quick question. If we were... Uh, awarded the summary judgment, we won the case. It was dismissed, okay? 
what is left for Mr. Parente to do? File a notice of entry. He needs to take the judge's decision yep. and serve it upon opposing counsel. Okay. And then take. Opposing counsel was there when they oh, dismissed yeah. it. Yes. Okay, go ahead. Serve it upon opposing counsel <coughs> mm -hmm. and then file with the court. Uh, or the file with the court clerk, the decision and notice that he's, or evidence that he's given it to opposing counsel. Okay. Now, paperwork. Paperwork. It's paperwork. Okay. It, it's wrapping it up. We should be getting <coughs> Parente's final bill and be done with it. Mm -hmm. And it shouldn't be big. Very good. Thank you. Well, Mr. Chairman, I think that's all we have to offer to me. Okay. Uh, the, the AEC, the, the Albany Energy, the latest, their latest suit, wasn't there a challenge to recover? Uh, yes, there is. I didn't mention that. I didn't see it. I, didn't hear it. I apologize. Uh, yes, there is the Albany Engineering suit. Um, Albany Engineering filed a suit against us seeking payment. We asked the Attorney General to represent us in that case. The Attorney General did interpose an answer. Um, and uh, so that's, right. that's where we stand at this point. Okay. Uh, I suspect the next thing we'll get involved in is discovery that hasn't come down the pike yet. Okay. That's all I have. <clears throat> All right. We'll be dead to death. Finance Committee. Mr. Stolberg. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. First, we have uh, approval of expenses of board member Klang for uh, travel on official business from January to pretty much to this date. The, uh, the expenses have been reviewed and approved by chief financial officer and they amount to four hundred and twenty seven dollars and eight cents and I recommend that we approve I'd like to make that motion we have a motion and second all in favor all in aye. Aye. okay one steps old business we have none and new business we have a resolution to adopt a New York State travel manual and Mr. Ferrar will explain that thank you Mr. Stover <coughs> for those of you who have the board report on page 20 uh, the brief memo again this is also uh, having to do with the action plan as delivered uh, on July, well, as a response to the July 20th letter. Uh, Chairman Bergstresser delivered the action plan, uh, which uh, did call for uh, the adoption of a travel manual and, it's, and that, that be our operative policy for travel meeting reimbursement. Um, the district, since for all the years leading up to that particular, uh, to this particular resolution to adopt the uh, guidelines has had as its travel uh, policy a resolution that uh, is in the packet and it has been revised at least four times. Most of what was in that resolution really uh, regurgitated or reiterated what is in the district enabling legislation that the members of the board uh, shall not receive a salary and other compensation, but shall get all the expenses <coughs> in terms of uh, you know their performance of their duties. Um, I'm not sure whether or not, in terms of the policy. Uh, the resolution on the policy on policy making, whether or not this is also something that we think the board needs to uh, review uh, for the three meetings. I think the travel 
uh, and I'll just say one, one the travel guidelines which have uh, been in place for many years we have followed so there's nothing in here that is new uh, this is we are, we're not drafting a new policy we're just adopting formally what the state uh, and specifically the inspector general expects us to follow right so in, this, this is more of a formality as, as for my standpoint. just a simple question mm -hmm. in here does it cover uh, individuals such as the board members who are not employees who don't get paid by the state yes it does the travel guidelines yeah. yes it does because i see in here just looking quickly it covers employees and it's talking about yes the state of relatives or not and all that correct stuff. for the most part it it certainly has you know most of it is you know uh, does apply to yeah. employees of the state but there is a section in here uh that does speak okay. to board members and then the page 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 bottom of page 35. thank you the in answer to rick's question um because the regulating district has always adhered to those same travel guidelines the board's formal adoption of those travel guidelines is from my perspective, a mere formality. Uh, the board obviously could, if it elects to, uh, hear this at three successive meetings, but it's really more of a technicality to adopt those travel guidelines. Mm -hmm. You could do it today. Well, I think we could, we could go to a committee of the whole and uh, and Adopt the resolution. Here to the board. Here to the board. Here to the full board. All right. So we have a resolution to adopt the New York State Office of oh, it's Track OSC um, Travel Guidelines, Travel mm -hmm. Manual. The Travel Manual. Yeah. So I move that. I have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. I have a motion and second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? So moved. Uh, we had talked about uh, one of the thing in the absence of a specific district policy or procedure or guideline. Uh, we had talked about having the district look first to the applicable relevant state statute, then a relevant policy procedure or guideline. Um, for instance, with regard to the limitations on reimbursement for district employees for lost or damaged personal property, uh, staff would alert the board to the relevant state level guidance so that the board can uh, take action to limit mm -hmm. such reimbursements in compliance with the state statute. Okay. Um, so basically what we're proposing is the board adopt a motion uh, to direct staff to seek and follow state policy in the absence of a specific district policy. Mm -hmm. So where we run into something like the travel guidelines, where we have been following them, uh, this, this would formalize the fact that we're going to follow those things when they show up. If we have something specific like our uh, management exempt employment guidelines, uh, we would follow those in the absence of a policy or procedure uh, we follow the nearest applicable state guide. State. You want, so you're looking for a resolution for that? So I see a motion that would acknowledge that that is okay. going to be so a motion. A motion to direct staff to seek and follow relevant state policy pronouncements in the absence of a specific district policy. And that would apply as of the date of the resolution? Date of the motion. Date of the motion. Today's date. Today. Any other questions? All right. So you guys understand that? Do I have a motion? To make that motion. Adopt state. I'll second. All right. Motion and second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? So moved. Okay. So okay. we'll use the state guidelines as a backup. Yeah. Now, last, we'll uh, do item B, the Chief Financial Officer's report. Thank you, Mr. Stover. <coughs> well, I do. 
Okay. 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 My report, I believe, is on page 36. And I'll, <clears throat> excuse me, I'll just summarize on the district fiscal outlook highlights, starting with the Hudson River area. The executive director has already brought to the board's attention the fact that we are now probably within that one year fiscal period of the Hudson River area's cash flow possibly going negative, and there could be times where, based on how receipts from at that time were only our revenue um, sources right now are just two, permit system fees and the water fees that we receive from EJ West. So um, in anticipation of the shortfall now, I've started doing some uh, more analysis on how we may need to manage uh, our payables. And uh, again, back to the reason why we wanted to look at or why we continue to look at any ongoing cost reductions that we can find. So let me just go to, uh, to those. There's three items. Mr. Clark spoke to two of them. I'll, I'll, the third one is, well, let me, let me just uh, give you more detail on the first two. The USGS, right now, we are going to just to summarize, explore what we can do on the deferring the payment based on the current contract that's in place. Uh, and at the same time, for this next budget cycle, uh, assess what gauges we really need and, and that being, and that will result in a, a new agreement uh, that would be, I would believe, less than the 300000 Again, we may get extremely lucky in, in that other people will pick up some of these gauges that we determine as not being necessary, but we don't know that yet. So we'll go through that assessment. Because of the timing, I, I'm not sure whether or not we will have to do a lot in terms of assessing the gauge needs um, in the, in, the, in the short term, because we have a expedited, uh, you know, uh, on the appeal, and hopefully we get uh, some more definitive news as to where our funding is coming from. So if we expect to get funding, not that we shouldn't be paying for gauges we don't need, I think that assessment may not be as, you know, big of an effort, and I don't know how much we want to go crazy on reducing gauges that may not at the end of the day, change the price of this contract in a material way. However, the T1 line out of contract, that T1 line serves two purposes. Number one, it allows the two offices being Mayfield and Albany to view the camera feeds. It also allows the person who's up at the dam to have uh, access to email and to uh, be able to uh, look at files on the Albany server. I would recommend at this time, because I've just been informed that there's a very good possibility that there is a much more reasonable and cost-effective uh, broadband high-speed option out there, which happens to be Roadrunner business class, that was not in the area. It looks like it's gotten to the point where uh, we may actually be in uh, you know, their area of service, area. Oh, service area. Thank you. I've already received the pricing for that. And if we went with the highest speed uh, broadband option that they offer, it'll be a third of the cost we're paying currently per month. Right now it's $911 a month for a T1 line. I'm recommending to the board that we Immediate, and we are that contract has expired, so we're just month to month. So we have no contract obligation to keep that line. I'm suggesting to the board or recommend that the board authorize me to discontinue the service of that line, which will not discontinue the uh, camera feed or, or the camera recording of what goes on around the, the dam structure. The cameras will still record, they'll be in the DVR. The only thing that will eliminate is the ability of the two offices to actually see that camera feed. And in the meantime, in the interim period, I work with business class to see if we can get 
one of their higher speed options that may, I'm not, I'm, I, I can't guarantee it, but there's a possibility it may accommodate also the camera feed back down to the two offices. But right now, that $911, you know, for us to be able to, you know, look at, at, at the dam when we're in the office, because this is not something that is monitored 24 hours a day. And I would defer to, uh, I've had discussions with Mr. Fulton and, and others, and I think for a short period of time, I, I think that's a good option. And at a minimum, you know, we can reduce at the end of the day our broadband by probably at least 66%, if not you know, more. Yeah. The only other, the last item is webcasting. Uh, we're in a current contract. The webcasting cost is somewhere in the neighborhood of 2500 bucks a month. We're moving to a new solution, which would drive that down to around 1500 and change. Both solutions have a somewhat costly element to them called closed capture. The executive order that requires us to do webcasting also states in there that closed captioning upon request. So if, if you are not closed captioning and you have someone out in the public who says, I'm hearing impaired, whatever, they don't have to give reasons, and they want closed captioning, then you're supposed to offer it. I'm suggesting that Until just for this step. That. Have we ever had a request? Until we we've never had we've never right. had a request because we've oh, always right. offered. <clears throat> yeah. huh? uh, I'm not sure whether or not we have anybody out there who really needs closed captioning. I don't know that for certain, but we can certainly find out by not putting the closed captioning out on this just this next meeting and, and see what happens. If somebody asks for it, we turn it right off. Uh, if they don't ask for it, every month they don't. We save some, and I don't have the exact number, but we'll save hundreds of dollars a month. More importantly, this next contract that we're going to, where we're going to do our own webcast production, we have to pay for that closed captioning up front, which is 6000 and change. And that payment would have to go out be between now and probably November. I'd certainly like to avoid that, too. So I'm just suggesting that the board authorized me to just delay the, the closed captioning until which point somebody calls us and says, I need that closed captioning. Anyone have any objections? No. No. Do we have to have a formal motion? Or no. Go ahead. So those are the three areas on the cost reduction side. Um, the executive director already got into the, the exact payment for the Fulton County was $3,045,000. 33765. I had it wrong also. Um, we've gotten into the HRA assessment receivable. Will, if collected by the civil recovery, <coughs> state, will, could take 22% off. I think the way that we get that, we recoup that is by uh, whatever gets taken off on that fee. Remember, these are budgets, these assessments are covering budget costs going back to three years. We can look at what items in the budget that we would not be able to fund due to that 22%, and we reassess those specific items. And I can do a review, present it to the board, and ask the board to authorize me to then reassess or include in the next three-year budget cycle these items versus sticking some 22% assessment, because that's really what it's doing to us. It's not allowing us to fund something. And unless the board has any questions, that's all I have with my report. Although I do have a motion I'd like to ask the board to make, and this is having to do again with the IG's report. This one having to do with the official workstation of the executive director. Uh, back on August 2nd, 2010, when Mr. Clark was made the acting executive director, uh, Mr. Klein, as board chair, uh, said that his, that the second field office would remain Mr. Clark's official station or work location. Uh, I'm now asking the board by motion to make this more formal and to include in the motion that, uh, in addition to that being his work location, that it has also been determined that that work location is in the best interest of the regulating district pursuant to NYCRR Title II, Chapter 1, Part 8, 
which is the specific uh, rule and regulation that states that it is the agency head's responsibility uh, to uh, designate the official workstation for uh, the executive director and others within the district. So I, just housekeeping? Say again? It's just sort of housekeeping? Or well, uh, again, just making it formal that, <coughs> because again, back to the IG's report, one of the items was that the oh, our official station. Now, OSC, uh, their only role in this is that they will review whatever official workstation that the board chair with the board through motion approves, and uh, that's their only role. I've, I've reached out to them because the, the inspector general was asking for uh, us to uh, send an application to OSC for them to approve uh, this designation, and that's not required. I've reached out to OSC, and they do not need to do that. Still on finance committee. So, are you, would, would you like me to read the motion as I'm going to open it up to the full board? Yes. Mm -hmm. All right, so let's open up the full board. So, I need a motion to. Well, author, this is to acknowledge that the official workstation designated by the board chair back in August 2010 for Mr. Clark is the second negative field office located in Bunker Hill, blah, 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 and has been determined to be in the best interest of the regulating district pursuant to NYCR Title II Chapter 1, Part 8. Any discussion as far as I, what the expenses of him being does it change either it? in Watertown or in Albany oh, or in Mayfield might be? It, Mike, do you want to explain a little bit where you spend most of your time? Uh, on any given week, um, it, it will be three or four days a week out of the second dog field office. Um, probably a day a week in Albany. Um, it has been less frequent, although I plan to do uh, increase my frequency in, in, uh, in the Black River area again um, to uh, every couple of weeks. Um, nevertheless, the majority of my time is spent <coughs> at uh, working out of the Second Dog Field Office. <coughs> Most of the, again, most of the, uh, the daily business is conducted over the telephone or via email um, on any given day. There are certainly meetings, and regardless of where you're located at that point, you travel for them more often than not. Um, and yet your location in, in Mayfield provides you the opportunity to do day trips both to Watertown and Albany as well as Stillwater? They, I will be honest, Typically. day trip to Watertown is difficult in in my opinion, uh, day trips to Stillwater are easily doable. Day trips to Albany, of course, are, right. you know, an hour each way. But it's much less frequent that you have to go to Watertown. It has been my practice for the last year to, yeah, I have not been to Watertown on that. Uh, uh, I go ahead and make that motion. Yeah. Mr. Sorry, motion. Mr. That's fine. Do I have a second? No a second. Mr. Stover. All right, so I have a motion and second. Any discussion? All right, all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, opposed? So I'll move there. So, Rick, can I just ask you a quick question? By all means. Um, you don't have to be exact, but roughly, how, what's the percentage that HR is paying and BR is paying as far as? Uh, in terms of general board, I yeah. uh, It is very similar to last year, so it's. Carol, I think it's 61 and change versus 38 and change, 38 being Black River. Okay, thanks. Anything else? If I could just add one more thing. I, I, when I looked at the just the annual close, the audit we just went through to close through 632,000 level travel year over year in comparison to 2010 was 42,000 in 2010. Versus about eleven or twelve thousand in 2011. So just the, I mean, official workstation proximity means a lot. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's an interesting figure. Uh, All right. Any other? Just bring it up. I do have one other motion. Okay. And 
Well, actually, two motions related. Uh, this also is in regards to the IG's request for supplemental information pertaining to the response, um, the August 19th response to the IG. Uh, it stated that the CFO conducted an analysis which resulted in a finding that the attendance uh, at the 50th anniversary parties uh, was compulsory and that the expense of the district was therefore necessary. It also stated that meals provided to staff at meetings was necessary expenditure of district funds. Um, they specifically requested in their follow in their supplemental request that, an, that the analysis conducted by the CFO at that time, which was myself, which determined the 50th parties and the payment of meals for staff during meetings was necessary expenditure of the funds. So they want an analysis uh, of that fact and also any meetings such as this meeting or resolution which reflects the board's endorsement of that determination that I made back then to the 50th parties and meals provided at board meetings at district expense. Um, so I'd like to offer the board my analysis which, uh, which I have written down which was my analysis back then. <coughs> Uh, first and foremost, the and this is as it specifically pertains to the anniversary gatherings, one held in Johnstown for Hudson River, one held in Watertown for Black River. Uh, that first and foremost, both events uh, were in recognition of a one-time significant event. Um, each of those commemorative events, uh, the former director presented uh, an eight to 10 minute video detailing the history of both watersheds, followed by a 114 slide PowerPoint presentation explaining uh, to who attended, uh, which included local officials and community leaders, the issues that were faced by the district and that the district was facing at the time. Also, there was a special, special guest speaker at each presentation who gave a presentation. Following those presentations, uh, the former director led a question and answer session for which he requested the senior staff to be available to answer any questions that arose and I quite frankly don't recall if there were any questions even asked or answered at that time. Uh, each event was attended by the district's board, senior staff, and many of its current and former employees. The events were by invitation only with the ex uh, expectation of the director that staff would make every effort to attend. Uh, the total cost incurred for both events was $2,770.85, uh, which covered the attendance of over 142 people, of which only employees and several special guests, um, of which all were government employees, did not pay. Everybody else paid, former employees and anybody else's guests paid. Um, for those employees that were in travel status, there were no per diems issued or requested or issued, and there were no other travel-related expenses uh, submitted for reimbursement for those either of those two events. Therefore, based on the aforementioned, I came to the conclusion that both events in question were compulsory to staff, served a business purpose, and as such, the expenses incurred were considered reasonable and necessary. Uh, as it pertains to the board meetings, it was my opinion, it continues to be my opinion, as the Chief Fiscal Officer of the District, that board meetings were and are compulsory, compulsory business events for senior staff. Uh, there, and that accordingly, there's a reason, it's reasonable to provide a lunch to staff who are expected to attend, or were at that time expected to attend said board meetings, many of which did not conclude as expected, and were in remote areas of the watershed. Uh, in many cases, staff members were in travel status. Accordingly, with respect to the lunch uh, provided following certain board meetings, because not all board meetings uh, that were attended was there a lunch, uh, I concluded that the expense associated excuse me, with said lunches was necessary and reasonable. So I have two motions one dealing specifically with the 50th, which is a motion for the board to endorse the analysis indicating that staff's attendance at the 50th events was compulsory, that meals provided to staff at such events in lieu of direct meal expenses or per diems 
or necessary expenses of such events and that each such event serve a legitimate regulating district business purpose. I have a second motion that deals directly with the board meetings and that is for a uh, motion to endorse the CFO's analysis indicating that meals provided to staff in conjunction with board meetings noted in the Inspector General's report were where many meetings ran longer than expected and or were in remote locations were necessary expenses of such meetings and each such meeting served a legitimate regulating district business purpose. I have a question to the council. Is, is this what the IG is, in your opinion, looking for? Or? Well, I want to lay this to rest. These are the two things they're asking for. Specifically. I have no yeah. problem with it. They're, the IG is basically asking for Why? one, an analysis conducted by the chief fiscal officer, which determined that the 50th anniversary parties and the payment for meals for staff were necessary expenditure of district funds. We had noted. Your letter, your August 19th letter, had noted that the CFO had made that determination and that the board had endorsed that determination. Uh, the drafts of that letter that were prepared in early August contemplated that the board was going to have to get together in mid-August and that at that meeting we would have this discussion and that the board would have an opportunity to opine one way or the other. Um, as you remember in August we, we never got there. We never got this far into that discussion. Now, by the same token, uh, in the spring of 2009 when these things were put together, the, the two commemorative events were put together, uh, the board was certainly aware, the, the then sitting board was certainly aware of what was going on and, and uh, you know, paid the expenses, mm -hmm. attended the events. Uh, I think if not compelled, acquiesced in the executive director's compelling of senior staff to be there. Uh, and certainly, I think, understood at that point that, that Mr. Lefebvre uh, anticipated attendance by as many other staff as he could get there. Uh, I don't think it's any great mystery to anybody that none of us were thrilled to have to take a couple of nights out to go to these events, but we all went. Um, you know, Albert, at that point, you were a, Mr. Hayes, at that point, you were a, a, a staff member, and you, know, you, you can opine as to, you know, whether you felt you were supposed to go or not. Um, now that we are further down the road, we've set our piece to the Inspector General. The Inspector General sent back a letter asking us to document each of the things that we had done and these are, what are the documents the, well these are the final two elements mm -hmm. of, of things that were required to do with regard to those commemorative events um, I don't think anybody's questioning whether or not the events were proper um, I think if you asked senior staff at that point, we would have said that they weren't the greatest idea. Uh, but did they serve a business purpose? Was that purpose, you know, notorious and evident in, in the conduct of those events? Sure. Were staff compelled to be there? Yes. So therefore, are the expenses of staff reasonable to uh, reasonable for the board to pay right. I think that's the question that the inspector general wants this board to answer uh, 
I think they recognized that you were not the board that was sitting at the time the events took place. Their question is, should you, as the sitting board now, recoup from the current staff and any former staff member who may have attended that event the monies that the board expended for those people to attend mm -hmm. and and you either you know the inspector or the uh, CFO Rick is is basically said that he believes no mm -hmm. if you endorse that then that's the message we send back to the inspector general if you don't endorse that then we uh, Look to recoup. We look to recoup the twenty dollars from current and former staff members. Many of which are not in our employees. Any questions? Any? Do anybody have any comments? Mm. Let's, let's I just approve it and get it over with. Do we do the resolutions individually, or can we? Uh, two motions. Two yeah. Two motions. Both individually. Okay. So the first motion is on the table. It's analysis with regard to the fiftieth anniversary party. If we understand it. Do I have a motion? I'll Do I have a motion? Do I have a second? And a second. Motion and second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? <coughs> Here. Second motion. Meals provided to staff in conjunction with the board meetings. My analysis. I'll make that as a motion. I have a motion. I have a second. A second. Okay, I'll, Mr. Hayes. Motion for a second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? So moved. <coughs> did, yes. I, I didn't notice. Did Mr. Hayes abstain on the first motion? Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Can you note that Mr. Hayes is abstained on the first motion? I just looked at the 50. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Yep. Okay. All right, Operations Committee. Mr. Hayes. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Under old business, we have no old business to discuss, but under new business, we have a uh, resolution to accept Old Forge and Six Lake Engineering Assessment Proposal to Mr. Fulton, and I'll turn that over to him. <coughs> Mr. Hayes. I believe that's on page 70, begins on page 74, a memo, a memo summarizing <clears throat> the proposal we received from Camp Dresser McKee back in July 2000, uh, this year, the board conditionally awarded the engineering assessment work uh, for the Six Lake and Old Forge Dam to CDM, and we requested a scope work and fee proposal. The CDM has submitted those, and they're attached to my memo. <coughs> Uh, they propose to conduct uh, records review, safety inspection, hazard classification, reconnaissance, and necessary work to develop the engineering assessments for both facilities, uh, which will include physical, structural, hydraulic adequacy analysis uh, of the facilities and result in a hazard classification, hydrologic and hydraulic uh, seepage and stability assessments and uh, conclude with a report written engineering assessment report for the facilities uh, which will uh, discuss CDM's review and conclude as to whether each facility is in conformance with current dam safety criteria and CDM will also recommend as appropriate any remedial work that may need to be uh, completed to bring the facilities into conformance with applicable uh, DEC dam safety regulations. Additionally, CDM will develop inundation mapping for us uh, that will be combined with our existing emergency action plans. And uh, CDM proposes to complete the engineering uh, services for a not to exceed price of $94,500. Staff recommends acceptance of CDM's proposal and seeks authorization to form contract for the completion of the work and authorization for the executive director to execute an agreement in the amount of $94,500. Are there any questions? I'd be glad to entertain those. 
I don't know. So you'd like to make a motion? What's that? Uh, I would I'll go ahead and make a motion to propose the resolution. No, bring it to the full board. Bring it to the full board. Okay. All right, bring it to full board. We have a motion to accept the resolution. We accept the resolution. Do I have a second? First was Mr. Mr. Klein. Do I have a second? Mr. Mr. Stover. All right, first and second. Any other discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? So moved. Now that we got that settled, <laughs> we'll bring up to the chief engineer's report, Mr. Fulton again. Mr. Hayes. The report begins on page 93, I believe it is, yes, and uh, these are my, my normal highlights uh, kind of stand out even compared to those uh, we're accustomed to, I guess, the monthly precipitation in the Hudson River area um, was between 215 and 266 percent of, of average. That was through August 29th, so we certainly... As, as our executive director pointed out, mm -hmm. uh, picked up the first of two tropical events which hit the, um, the area within seven or eight days of each other. And as a result, inflow to Great Sakandaga Lake uh, was about 460 percent of historic average. At Indian Lake, it was about 237, 240 percent of historic average. Um, most of those numbers, if you look at the graphs of our, our elevation throughout the summer, which are on page, beginning on page seven of my report, uh, you'll see we were uh, quietly moving along our target curve uh, until the very end of the month of August. And uh, while I didn't separate out the calculations in terms of precip or inflow, I'm pretty confident that uh, most of those 200 and 400 respectively percentages uh, came in that last two or three days of the month. Uh, <clears throat> and in the Black River area, uh, we had similarly high, higher numbers, but uh, not, uh, not quite as high. Uh, monthly precip range from 117 to 167 percent of average. And, and actually, uh, inflow to the Stillwater Reservoir is uh, slightly below historic average at about 82 uh, percent. And that's also reflected uh, in, in the graphs. Uh, in the precipitation from Irene was not nearly as heavy in the Black River area as it was in the Great Sakandaga Lake and Hudson watershed. And with regard to uh, that event, as well as the Tropical Depression Lee, or the remnants of Lee. <coughs> Certainly at Sakandaga, again, as the executive director mentioned, uh, we, we took some um, uh, steps uh, for about four or five days and releasing some additional water within the uh, limitations of the offer settlement. Uh, we didn't uh, de deviate from the flow thresholds, but, but merely uh, increased our release, maximizing it headed into, uh, again, the last the four or five days before Irene moved into the area. Now, that allowed us to get rid of about three-quarters of a billion cubic feet of water, which is about, uh, about nine inches in terms of elevation at Great Sakandaga Lake. And uh, we brought the reservoir down to an elevation of about uh, 762.7, which was about half to three quarters of a foot below our target. And uh, as it turned out, uh, having now reached a peak elevation of about 769 uh, and three quarters, uh, helped out uh, somewhat. And I guess just like any, even any summer rainstorm event, uh, while this was certainly magnitude was and quantity was a lot larger. It, the the uh, watersheds reacted the same as they would to any storm in late August when it's been very dry. And, and almost as quickly as it came in, it, it, it left the system. 
and uh, we were shut down for a few days uh, at the um, uh, at the beginning of the the month, or at the I should say at the tail end of August, and then again uh, more recently uh, we were shut down as a result of the <coughs> inflow from the remnants of Lee. Uh, but as of the 11th, we started our releases at Great Sakandaga again, and. Uh, Although slowly are, are pulling the reservoir elevation down, uh, we, we still remain close to uh, six and a half feet above target. And uh, it will take some time to bring it down at, at about 4,000 cubic feet per second. Uh, you know, there's, until the flow in the Hudson drops off significantly, uh, we probably won't be able to exceed that release. And, as I said, it'll be weeks before we're starting to approach target elevation in that location. In the uh, Black River area, again, because the precipitation wasn't as, as great, uh, we are already maximized our release, and that's still water. Uh, in particular, we're only about uh, 1.3 feet above our target elevation. So it should only take, I would say, at at the current drawdown rate, uh, about a, a week and a half to bring that reservoir back down to a target elevation. Um, if there are any questions, I'd like to take those. You know, as somebody who lives on the lake, I just got to say publicly, considering the terrible mess that was downstream, considering the devastation that was down there, I thought you guys did a great job. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we actually. In terms of, of uh, flow, we had an instantaneous six-hour average inflow at Great Sakandaga Lake on the 28th of about 40,000 cubic feet per second. Uh, that, over that period of time, clearly would be a peak that I think would not have attenuated, would have moved through the Sakandaga River into the Hudson River. Um, maybe not sustained at that level by the time it reached the Mohawk, mm -hmm. but um, clearly would have been substantially more water than, uh, than what was naturally flowing in the Hudson at the time. The Mohawk mm -hmm. um, at the confluence with the Hudson was flooding. And uh, at the top of my head, I think a 20,000 CFS incremental flow would have caused about a foot rise greater upstream of that confluence down at uh, the Mohawk and the Hudson. So certainly 40,000 peak for a six-hour period uh, would have produced even more significant rises. Uh, uh, there, there was some, some, definitely some significant benefit in terms of flood protection, uh, even under those conditions that were experienced uh, along the Mohawk and, and its confluence with the Hudson. I heard the term 400 year or 500 year event. I wouldn't doubt, I wouldn't yeah. certainly doubt it, yeah. Bantied yeah. around a little bit. Yeah. Any more questions for Mr. Fulton? No, just my congratulations. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. Now we come to the Hudson River Area Administrator's Report, Mr. Hodgson. Thank you, Mr. Hayes. My report starts on page 167. We have some highlighted areas. I'll just cover real quick. Uh, I attended a ribbon cutting ceremony for the new fishing pier at the Northampton Boat Launch in Northville. All staff participated, as I mentioned earlier, in Hurricane Irene preparedness. Uh, we had a confined space and emergency retrieval training held at the Conklinville Dam, hands on. We met. Uh, with the Northville Mayor Groff in regards to the Northville uh, Village of Northville putting fishing piers on the Little Lake. They're proposing that idea. We inspected various erosion sites and started to assemble an erosion site repair list for this fall. Hopefully being able to do it with existing stone that's already there on the beach so we don't have to purchase any, just using manpower and equipment to shore up the areas. Uh, assisted maintenance special, we did some erosion repair work already. We've started some with uh, some riprap that we've had stockpiled. 
Uh, had our representative from the New York State Insurance Fund come in and conduct a chainsaw and personal protective equipment training at the field office for staff. The staff, staff has been busy staking out new permits, doing boat counts, encroachments, and work permit inspections, along with vehicle maintenance and ground maintenance at SFO, Conklinville, and Indian Lake, uh, along with other items that are stated in my report. We have had a couple of meetings, and I've asked staff what we can do to improve customer relations. Um, one, we're looking to turn around the work permits that are submitted and the stakeouts and trying to get them done quicker for people. Um, we've also uh, looking at ways that we can do things internally in the office to do better business. I've also asked the staff of ways to cut some costs at the second dog field office in Conklinville. And to date, um, for an instance, we've got a smaller dumpster and we've updated our cell phone service and at a cost of approximately $125 a month so far. And then we're looking at our landlines that we had at SFO. There's a couple discrepancies there and I'm predicting a, uh, some cost savings there also. And last but not least, I just want to thank all the staff at SFO for the hard work they put forth in the last two months of my new job as administrator. And a special thanks to Sue for all the tasks that uh, I've asked her to do beyond her normal duties and helping me with the many questions I've had in my new position. And a special thanks also to Dan Holchi, who's been a real asset to me in his expertise as a land surveyor and the extra time that he spent with these different encroachment issues and still fulfilling his assigned duties. So, thank you, Mr. Hayes. That's all, unless anybody has any questions, questions on anything, that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, John. Next, we'll come to uh, the Black River Area Administrator, Mrs. Wright. Thank you, Mr. Hayes. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, above and beyond our normal routine maintenance and operations, both in the uh, Watertown office and in our field office. We are uh, continuing to work on the stem replacement in gate three at the Stillwater Dam and expect delivery of the stem to come in in early October. So we'll be putting that stem in October. But in the meantime, we are uh, preparing for additional brackets that go inside the well for the stem. We also uh, have begun working on patchwork on the surface of the Stillwater Dam, different areas that have gotten a little of erosion of the concrete. Um, we too had a, uh, the rumblings of the earthquake from Virginia, felt not only in the Old Forge area, but up in Stillwater. As a result, we did inspections, our routine inspections throughout our facilities and prepared also with the engineers and uh, the National Weather Service for the possible arrival of Hurricane Irene. So other than that, we are preparing now for our fall season. Uh, we hope to be able to do one more fertilizing and liming of the dike area at Stillwater and um, expect that we can do that also in October. Sure, after that, we may be expecting some white stuff. Do you have any questions that you have to entertain? Yeah, that's good. So you, you had a couple of unscheduled shutdowns. Was that due to the weather um, that you had to go respond to? No, and I, well, sometimes it is the weather. These two, I'd have to think about. We had the electricity went off. One of them was weather. It was Friday night, and that was weather related. When the wind and the rain start, then the power lines go down. When the power lines go down, the mercer goes down. So we have to go out. Okay. Interesting. The other was on a Sunday morning. I don't believe that that was weather related. I think Mercer just went down to Good question. Um, there was some discussion a couple months ago about the pending sale of the uh, hydro plant at Stillwater. Is that still progressing? Hearing anything. I haven't heard anything. I'm not hearing anything. Is there a way we could get an update possibly and find out if that the, is moving forward, if, if indeed it's going to change hands. Uh, I can 
Can they make a call to somebody? To mm -hmm. Yeah, I can. You can, but in the absence of, it, there's been enough time gone by and that the last deal fell through. Any new deal that they propose, they still have to notify us so we'll know if they have a new deal in the works. Okay, okay, that's fine. Okay, that's good. Thank you, Carol. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Carol. You're welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay. Thank you. Uh, is there any board business that I would like to bring up? Mr. Ferrer. Uh, I'll list all the board members. I have none, anyway. What's your board I, I did overlook one item, again, uh, regarding the Inspector General's report, so there is, if you would indulge me, one more motion. This is in specific <laughs> regards to their request for any policies or procedures for a review of a more this and these these this is taken right out of the report back to them the action plan so they're looking for anything that we did with regard to a more robust review of monthly expenditures for board meetings and district business along with any app, uh, applicable board uh, minutes and resolutions I have uh, I prepared on page, I'm not sure how many board members actually have this in front of them, on page 69, 70, 71, ending on page 73, is uh, a memo and some uh, supporting documentation that deals with uh, additional uh, activities, I'll call them oversight, uh, internal control activities that I would like the board to adopt that would improve the board's ability to perform their oversight of travel uh, and meeting expenses associated with staff. Um, additional, it'll really involve just additional monthly reporting. This is nothing new. All of this stuff exists. It's just at a little lower level of detail. Uh, I would uh, offer that the board receive this additionally with the year-to-date financial summary that I already provide, uh, along with the budget breakdown by account. So right now you have the budget, the highest level, then the budget breakdown will say in the account for general board or staff, which is the travel account, <coughs> there's $1,000 expended. That's, that's what you see today. What we'd like to, what I'd like to additionally and to that would be uh, a what is called a general ledger detail report, which would break out that thousand dollars to the expenses uh, that, for example, uh, we approve for a board member. And so each line item, either whether it's a staff member or a board member, and then one other item would be the standard voucher, which covers the travel card uh, detail, which is what the director uses to pay for either the meeting room or the night stays at the hotel. And that would be in detail. It would, it's basically just a voucher that's prepared that goes to OSC. So the board would specifically see uh, all of the charges that, for the most part, are not many any longer, and they're generally room charges. Uh, or if a dinner prior to the meeting was charged on that card. So I'm recommending that the board uh, adopt those additional internal control activities that would be necessary to improve the board's oversight of the monthly travel and meeting expenses of staff. And that's the motion I offer. Okay. So, summarize it just a here. So this is a motion to adopt additional internal control activities necessary to improve the board's oversight of monthly and travel meeting expenses of staff. All right, we understand that. So, which is basically going to be the three reports I just cited, mm -hmm. in addition to what you received today, and I will verbally go through that at each meeting. Can you break it down a little further? I'll right. make that as a motion. I have a motion. I second. Mr. Klein. Motion and second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? So. Thank you. I have Mr. Yes, go ahead. One other uh, item, uh, also with regard to the Inspector General. Mm -hmm. uh, as we've been discussing the entire meeting, uh, on August 29th, uh, the Inspector General 
had sent us a request for documentation of the steps, procedures, resolutions, determinations uh, alluded to in the chairman's uh, letter sent in response to the Inspector General's July 20th report. We have touched on all of those uh, policies, procedures, etc., uh, save one. The, the last paragraph of this report requests a response to this re last request no later than September 14th by 10 a.m., which is tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. Uh, it suggests that that can be made by electronic transmission back to the investigator who presumably wrote the uh, July 20th report for the Inspector General and sees me on the letter to the chairman as counsel for the regulating district. Um, because I'm counsel, I'm also the ethics officer. And as the ethics officer, uh, I think it's my role and duty to ensure that the board have my advice regarding certain ethics matters. Um, the last item that the Inspector General asks for in this uh, response to our reply regards the improper payment to reimburse the district employee for the loss of personal property referred to in the report and they ask that we please advise of all steps taken to recoup said district funds. I'm not sure that it's an ethics matter as much as a bookkeeping matter, but it is something that the Inspector General does not appear likely to uh, let go away. Mm -hmm. Wasn't it approved by the comptroller? Well, yes and no. Um, there was an expense, there, there was a loss of personal property, and that loss then resulted in submission of a request for reimbursement. Properly made to the proper uh, people at the district who brought it to the board. The board made a determination which, uh, based on the uh, advice and counsel provided by uh, staff of the board, they, they made a determination to, to make the repayment. The only thing that they missed, and perhaps because they didn't have an attorney available at the time, was the statutory prohibition on reimbursements exceeding a limit set in the state finance law. So, and I, I forget exactly what the figure is, $465 they, they set back. But by statute, they should not have re should not have allowed reimbursement above three hundred and fifty dollars. So, in my estimation, the board is in a position where they're really compelled by the ongoing interest by the inspector general in this matter to ask for repayment of the $114 and change that is outstanding. The Inspector General intimated in their initial report that they wanted <coughs> repayment of the entire amount and suggested that the board improperly awarded reimbursement for any portion because they felt that the employee was negligent in the manner in which they parked their car, left materials in the car, didn't bring those things into the home, which quite honestly I think is overreaching on their part. I don't think it, the Inspector General 
should have tried to make that kind of a conclusion, and I think they erred in making that determination. I think the sitting board at the time the reimbursement was made considered those issues, determined based on the facts before them that the employee was not in the wrong, and made the reimbursement. <clears throat> the only issue is that they made the reimbursement in excess of the statutory amount that they were permitted to. So I think it's incumbent on the board to request that that employee return the amount reimbursed <coughs> over that amount they are statutorily entitled to have. Um, and if we don't, my turn. However, because of our mistake, she's lost her window. She, I'm sorry, the employee has lost the window for the attempt to recoup that through their the, their insurance. If I'm not mistaken, right? That I, I, I mean, it's just, I have no facts upon which to right. base a determination. I mean, there's there is a state, there's there's a certain amount of time. I, I, from what I've understood and read about that, the statute, it seems to me that they want the employee to re try, attempt to recoup it through their own personal insurance, auto insurance, for theft. Is that I, just I suspect a, that's probably true. We, mm -hmm. Regardless, I suspect that the deductible is such that it's not going to be worth right. pursuing. But I'm not giving that advice. I'm just right. offering that as... I, I have difficulty the discussion with this. I have difficulty when a governing board makes the decision, whether it's right or wrong at the time, to make a payment in this case, and then down the road something comes up that determines that they made the wrong decision based on lack of knowledge per se, mm -hmm. or for whatever reason. And then you go back to the employee and say, Oh, by the way, you owe us X number of dollars, we screwed up. You know, I've never supported that on any board that I've sat on, and I don't know how, you know, we could support that today. My question is, if this board decides and says, look, you know, what's happened has happened and it was in the past, we're going to go forward, what position does that put us in? You slap on the hand, or I, we don't know, or I don't know. I mean, the I have the initial mm -hmm. report. I, I can't quote it from memory, but if the board elects to take no steps in response to this letter. Staff will simply say the board's taking no steps to recoup. I don't know that that in and of itself is a violation. Um, if it were not an employee, if we had a, a project that the engineering group <coughs> brought forward, certain amount of concrete was to be poured in a certain spot and a bill was submitted and an invoice was processed and the decimal point was moved and a payment went out, that payment would still get approval by the, by the Office of the State Comptroller. But there's a contract. There, there is a contract, but so instead of $2,200, we paid $22,000. There, clearly, the board would have an obligation to go attempt to recoup right. the money from the contractor. I don't think anybody's arguing that. No, nobody's arguing that point. If an employee had a paycheck issued to them, and instead of $475 for the the seasonal employees work on whatever, we issued $4,700 to that employee. We would be compelled right. 
to go recoup that money. We can't dock our employees' pay, but, and the numbers are so small that it's not going to affect the district's finances going forward. But I think the perspective that the Inspector General has taken is that the amount paid is greater than the amount the employee was entitled to, and therefore the board should recoup the money. Now, should recoup. That, that's the impression that I get from right. reading the initial report and their continued follow-up on this issue. Should make an attempt to recoup. Right. Distinguish that against <coughs> the $15,000 and change right. that they indicate Mr. Lefebvre has enjoyed without authorization. And they have not asked us to try to recoup that money. Yeah. 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 So I'm not sure whether they plan to do it or they plan to get around to telling us to do it later on. I believe, didn't they tell us to come up with some kind of a plan to recoup some of that? No, they they gave a generic that. statement regarding recoup of monies due to the board that were improperly right. paid or reimbursed. Much of that has been dealt with by <coughs> Rick's recitation of his determinations with regard to the uh, commemorative events and with regard to the lunches provided to <coughs> the, the other thing noted. I think when you separate out Glenn Lefebvre, the other thing left was this. Could, could we get back to him and say something to the effect that the, based on uh, a straw poll or whatever, that, that the board strongly... Board of hmm? Board opinion? Or? Yeah, the, the board's opinion is that this amount of money to be, be attempted to be recouped at this late date is um, not whatever, feasible. Okay. Or the fact that it was not a clerical error, but it was a yeah, I, lack of judgment by the board, a lack of knowledge by the board itself that approved it originally. Well, along with the approval by Comptroller's office? Yeah. No, that I, well, the Comptroller's going to sign any check. Yeah, I would throw that in. Cause that's, that is a, it's a red herring. They're just going to do whatever we want. But well, I'm just saying that's a fact. Your yeah. example was a yeah. real mistake of a wrong decimal point, and that's yeah. not what happened. That's a clerical error, too. We passed a specific a amount, and that's the amount that was paid. Right. Can now, just, we made a mistake. Clarify, can I just clarify one thing? The board, and the board did not, this, this was an internal district transaction. Okay. There was no board approval of this right. at that time. Okay. So I just okay. want to make that it, clear. It's a hundred bucks. Okay. It happened before right. mine because was because 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 most of yours. Right. Because it was not a material so transaction. But, but again, it was based on your judgment. With a lack of knowledge, it was not a Absolutely. an accounting it's error. It was not but it wasn't time. the kind of error you were talking about. I think we were aware of that full amount. I think we should try to stand by our decision. Well, can, can you wordsmith something in that response that takes the flavor of what you're hearing from the board now and address the issue with the IG's office and I see if, if they want to take this another step? My recommendation is that the board compel repayment. I, I have to make that recommendation as the as general counsel of the board. Sorry. It's a money improperly sent to an employee. It's money due back to the board. Can you then state in the response to the IG's office that you have <laughs> categorically stated to the board uh -huh. that they look to to uh, collect that money and that we have it we have accepted your recommendation. Okay. Yes. Fine. Take it under advisement. Take it under advisement. Take it under advisement. Whatever. Whatever yeah, you words want to you, you want to put in there. Okay. And then that'll be up to the board then to do something at some time. Well, does the board want to 
put forth a motion to determine it one way or the other? Why can't we just uh, acknowledge and contemplate what they have uh, pointed out to us? You've advised us of the legality, you know, the, the direction we should go in based on the law, and that we as a board have decided to uh, deal with it internally. And it's our business. Yeah. You got the flavor of what we want? We've been made aware of the statute. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. and we won't do it again. No, I wouldn't even go No, I won't, but I mean, that's. You know, we're, we're, we've been made aware of the statute. Rob, Rob is you've been, you've advised due diligence, us, and, and you will yeah. take it under advice. Okay. Okay. The general, maybe. <laughs> the specific answer? Is that? Well, right. that's, that's, that's the answer. That's the answer. I've advised the board and they're taking it under consideration. Or yeah, they, they say regarding the improper payment to reimburse a district employee for the loss of personal property referred to in the report. Actually, it's got to go under my. Please advise all steps taken to recoup said district funds. It's really your it's letter. It's got to be my answer. Mm -hmm. Take it under <clears throat> Well, we'll, actually, take, we'll take it under advisement. I, I think what we contemplate. We've been made aware of the statute. We'll take it under advisement. What? We need to document the steps. Is what right. It's asking what steps we'll take. And it doesn't sound like any steps we'll we'll take. Well, the steps are that it has been identified. It's been identified by the IG, mm -hmm. it's been acknowledged by the board, mm -hmm. it's been recommended by general counsel strongly that the two the board that he advises that the uh, repayment be sought and that's a, those are the steps. Yeah, let's delineate those steps for him. Okay. I'm happy now, with this one. This response happens. going back electronically, Rick's putting together an email. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you want that email to go to you and then you send it off to them? Or do you want us just to send it directly? You can send it directly. Send me just CC. Yeah, we'll CC. Okay. And we will be using, so these draft minutes will be part of, is that an issue? Like we're going to be, part of this response is going to include draft minutes of this meeting. Right. Mm -hmm. Which I think is fine. Right? That's fine. I just, sure. Well, we want to take you off the hook. Yeah, we'll, we'll call them as they are draft minutes. To me, it's to strongly to proceed. And I understand. You know, they're, we'll take the next step. We'll take the next step. Okay. Any other discussion? We need to figure out where we're going to meet again. All right, next board meeting. I need a resolution. And the resolution is to meet at the Utica, Utica State, State Office building. Correct. Genesee Street. Is this, the, is this the right date? Yeah, what is the date? Wednesday, October 12th. Should be the 12th. The because of Columbus Day. Monday is Columbus Day. Right, right. So we move that to Wednesday. Move the okay. meeting to Wednesday. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So it is the 12th, right? Okay. okay. All right, so I have a resolution. I have a motion. Make that motion. Second. Second. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? And a reminder to bring your identification badges. This is state building. Uh, motion to adjourn. So move. All right. Motion by the second. Second. I, want second. Well, I just wanted to talk. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Adjourn.